Um, all right, so I'm really excited that so many people are interested in this. Um, I think that data visualization is actually like one of the sort of core competencies that a researcher should have. And, and yet we don't really often get taught about it in any formal kind of way, or at least I didn't. Um, so it's always just kind of been like a side, like hobby of mine. And um, But yeah, I'm excited to bring it, uh, hopefully, uh, to you guys. And I'm gonna be talking more about um, both the principles. So this will be more high level intuition stuff. This should apply across whether you're using R or if you're using uh, you know, any other of the variety of data visualization software is available. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about practice and I'll uh, go a bit into how to do some of this stuff in R and using uh, ggplot too. So that's, I think, a good option, especially for first learning, but certainly not the only one. And at the end, I'll talk about some alternatives as well. So in case you don't know me, uh, I'm Jeff Gerard, and I'm now a postdoc at CMU, um, but I previously was a student in psychology here. So um, it's good to see some familiar faces and definitely good to be back in this room that I've spent many, many hours in <laughs> over the years. Um, if you wanna follow along, um, I don't think you'll really need to to really get a lot out of this, but you're welcome to. Uh, up here on my website, uh, jmgerard.com slash data hyphen viz with a Z. Um, you can get both the slides if you're having trouble seeing this, if there's glare or something. Um, if, but I put them on like SlideShare, I think. And then also you can download the, the data that I'll use and uh, the syntax and stuff like that. So I want to start first with uh, kind of waxing philosophical a little bit um, and kind of talking about like what is a graphic or a data visualization. So I'm going to show a bunch of examples of on the left, there'll be something that is a data visualization and then something on the right that has very similar form and composition, yet we wouldn't typically consider this to be a, a data visualization. And so what I want you to think about is kind of why. Why is this a data visualization and this isn't, despite those similarities? And what we'll get at is when I start talking about the principles of data analysis, this is going to kind of lead into how these principles can kind of help me answer this question on a deeper level. Um, but you know, one kind of naive approach would be, okay, well maybe the difference is there's you know, these axes here. You know, graphs have axes, maybe that's what makes it different. Uh, but if we go on, here's another type of data visualization, but there's not really an obvious set of axes here. Um, but you know, okay, but there's something similar to an axis. There's this color scale at the bottom. Um, so maybe if you have a, I don't know, an axis or a scale, that's a data visualization, and otherwise it's modern art or something. Um, but you can also think about other types of graphs that don't seem to have either of those things. You could probably argue that you know there is a scale here, um, that there is a, a, a type of axis, but there's not an obvious axis or scale here, and yet this is a data visualization. Um, so finally, maybe it's that, well, you know, there's numbers and there's letters, and so if you have scales or axes or numbers and letters, that's data viz, otherwise it's modern art or infographic or, I don't know, pop uh, art or whatever. Um, but then finally, you can think about something like this that has no obvious axis, no obvious scale, no text, no um, numbers on it, yet is, uh, trust me, is a data visualization. Um, and you know, again, you can kind of think about modern art that's similar in form of composition, yet doesn't have these properties. So it's not really enough to you know, just say that, well, all visualizations have this, um, and, and that is what makes it that. There's actually a lot of diversity or heterogeneity within data visualization. Um, and so what we really need is kind of a deeper way to understand what data visualization is. We need some principles. Um, and so the kind of easiest set of principles would be to kind of put these different visualizations into buckets, like discrete categories. Um, so you can say, okay, what, what type of graph do you think this is on the left? If you had to name that, give it a title, what would you call that? Yeah, some kind of scatter plot. Sometimes these are called bubble charts, especially if they vary by size. That's often turns it from a scatter plot into a bubble chart. Um, it depends on who you ask. Uh, how about this one? Some of you may have seen this, but probably a lot of you haven't. What type of graph is that? So it's, it's yeah, kind of like a heat map, but it's applied to geographic data. And so in this case, it gets a special name. It's called a choropleth map. Um, there's different types of graphs you can do with maps, and um, you know, there's all sorts of options. Um, how about this one? What would you call that one on the left? Pie chart. Okay, looks like a pie chart. Maybe you take a bite out of the center. Uh, so that's often called a donut chart. Very similar. How about this one on the right? Pastry chart. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. 
a network diagram is often what it's called. I know Aiden's a big fan of these. Um, so these are all different types of graphs. Again, there's a lot of variety. And so you can kind of spend a lot of time thinking about what are we going to call these? What names do we apply to them? And in fact, some people have. So if you go to this website, databizcatalog.com, there's just a, you know, a million of these different types. Um, you can kind of make yourself crazy trying to categorize all these things and find distinctions to split similar ones or group them. It almost becomes a little bit like the DSM in some ways um, for the clinical folks among us. Uh, but the point is that I think this is a, a really interesting exercise to study this and to read books about different types. But I actually think thinking about data viz in these discrete categorical terms is really limiting. So what I want you to do is, if you can, move beyond just thinking about, well, charts are either pie charts or donut charts or scatter plots or whatever, but think about these as like elements uh, that you could combine or um, iterate on. You know, kind of think about these as like prototypes. Um, and what you'll we'll see is that sometimes we have a really simple graph, like this is the kind of thing you'd often see in like a psychology journal, you know, a simple scatter plot. And I'll show you how to make that in R in a moment. And this is like a simple bar plot um, you know, that has like some sort of error bars on it, maybe confidence intervals. Um, and so this is very easy to put into one of these buckets and give a name. And that helps sometimes because then, you know, most people who have any sort of familiarity with data analysis, uh, visualization, will know exactly what this is. And they're not gonna have to invest a lot of time and energy thinking about what is this? How do I understand it? What does it mean? They're used to it and it matches their expectations. So that's powerful. But sometimes you actually wanna be a little bit more flexible and sometimes you can actually do much better if you move beyond these prototypes, these themes, and try to, again, combine things and go a little crazy. So I'll show you now an example of each of these that's kind of the same exact data, but represented in a different way that for some purposes might be a lot more effective. So for instance, now we have that same scatter plot, but we added this color scale, we added some regression lines, some standard error bands around those regression lines. So now it's kind of hard to put this into a bucket in some ways, it's still a scatter plot, but now there's these extra elements. So it's harder to put that into one group. But again, for certain types of purposes, like comparing the number of cylinders in a car, for instance, this might be much more effective. Uh, and in fact, if you're familiar with statistics, this would be an example of, by doing this, we moved from what looked like a linear trend overall um, to a Simpsons paradox. So where one of these groups actually has the reverse um, uh, pattern, where it goes from a, a downward slope to a positive one. So anyway, sometimes by doing this, you can explore your data and find some new patterns in it that you weren't expecting. And then here, instead of the bars, where we take all of that data that we have, all those data points, and we just kind of slap them we, into this one little bucket of the mean or the median or something. Here, we can actually represent that median or the mean as you know a dot or something. But then we can also get some indication of the individual data points, of their distribution. And so this, again, is really hard to put into a bucket. There's like kind of like a violin plot going on. There's this scatter plot, or what you'd formally call a jitter plot going on. Um, and then there's some sort of a summary statistic displayed as well. So anyway, by moving beyond just these basic elements and combining them in, in imaginative ways, using some of the principles we'll be talking about, I think you can do a much better job at you know, diversifying the types of messages and types of information you can communicate with your data. Okay. So what we really need here is uh, what some people have called a, a grammar of graphics, right? So a set of principles or rules that will define, uh, it'll give us things like a vocabulary for talking about this stuff, but also some rules about how to combine that vocabulary in interesting and powerful ways. And by having a sort of the shared system or fundamental you know, principles or rules, then we can all communicate in, in a really effective and powerful way. And this is gonna help us both to understand graphics so if I see you know, this thing, I've never seen anything like that before, but if I can understand, break it down into these core grammatical components or elements, then I'm gonna be able to kind of decipher it and understand it, and also maybe describe it to you if you're familiar with those principles as well. Um, and that's gonna help us with a diverse type of graphics. Um, and also you could argue that this is gonna help us make better graphics as well, but just like having good grammar doesn't guarantee that you're going to say like a, Grammatic, you can have a grammatically correct sentence that doesn't make any sense, right? So you can you know, basically master this stuff and still make really bad graphs, basically. But you're much more likely to, so it's sort of like it's, it's necessary but not sufficient, I think, to understand these, these principles. Um, 
And hopefully when we talk about when we move beyond the practice part, which is much more about the grammar and the vocabulary and the rules, to the principles, that's when we're gonna get into how to combine that information uh, in meaningful and helpful ways, all right? So there's different implementations or versions of the grammar of graphics. Uh, over the years, there's been at least four, but the one we're gonna focus on here uh, is a relatively recent one from 2010 from Hadley Wickham um, of our studio fame, and that's the layered grammar of graphics. So this isn't the only one, it's maybe some would argue not even the best one, but it's a really powerful one. And what's nice about it is it's implemented in R, uh, which is free open source software, through this ggplot2 package, which we'll be talking about today. So if you're gonna learn one, I think this is a really good one to, to start with. And you'll understand in a moment why it's called layered, but the gg and ggplot refers to the grammar of graphics. And for trivia, the two is because this is version two. <laughs> he redesigned it at a certain point to make it more powerful and uh, flexible. All right. So the, I'm gonna first start with these basic elements of the grammar, and then I'll move into some advanced ones. This is all gonna be very high level, all right? So if you have questions, let me know. But if you have like really specific questions, I'll get into that a bit later. The first part of any data visualization, of course, is the data. And so the data can take many different forms, but typically when we're gonna be creating graphics in ggplot2, we're gonna want them to be in a very particular format. And I think in general, for both data analysis and data visualization, this is a nice format. And that's called a data frame, or some people would call it like a data table, or in this case, a specific type is called a tibble, um, which is a specific type of table. But the basic idea behind all of these different versions of, of data is that it's, it's rectangular. So it's not, you know, like you have some Excel document and there's like data stored all over in these like crazy locations and it's in 20 different files and, you know, if somebody asks you to share or pull up that data from your dissertation years ago, then you know, God help you. The idea is that it's, it's in this nice clean format, what's often called a tidy format, where every row in this table is one observation. So that might be something like one participant or one observation of one participant or one company or whatever it is you're measuring. Um, and then we have a number of variables that are each a column. And so these variables are things that vary, that's why it's called a variable. They're basically attributes that describe each of these observations. So for instance, we're gonna be using uh, this data set called CARS, um, which is a subset of uh, the MPG, not Michael Begali, but uh, <laughs> miles per gallon um, data set that talks about different cars from the 90s and early 2000s and different aspects of those cars and then their fuel efficiency or miles per gallon. So if you're interested in buying a car from the 90s or early 2000s, you're in luck today, you're gonna to learn a lot about it. Um, and so in, for instance here, we have a bunch of cars. Uh, there's 230 in total, but we're just gonna preview the first 10. And so these are all uh, alphabetically sorted. So these are the Audis, the A4s, and then you'll see they have a different variable. So things like what year were they released? Uh, displacement is like the size of the engine. It's basically how many liters of fuel can fit in the engine. Um, number of cylinders, the class of car, like compact or SUV or pickup truck or whatever. And then here, uh, HWY and CTY are your highway and, and city fuel efficiency. So you want those to be high uh, to get good gas um, efficiency. So that's the data. Um, and again, if you can get it in this format, which is sort of a, that like data tidying task is something that we could have a whole nother uh, presentation about. Um, but for now, let's assume we have it in this nice format. Now we need to take this data, which is just basically numbers and letters, and we need to somehow turn that into a graphic. Um, and so if I just show you, I guess I'm like a stem and leaf plot or something, maybe we just use the data as it's like num numerical form, but typically we're gonna find other ways to represent this data that's easier for the human mind, um, the visual system to, to comprehend. And that is done through these aesthetic mappings. Uh, and so basically what an aesthetic mapping is, is it's something like position or shape or size or color or width or type. These are just the common ones, but there's a ton of different options. And each of these is also varying, right? You can have various colors, various positions, various shapes. And the idea is that we wanna take our variables, which vary. So maybe this car has a really big engine and this has a really small one. And we wanna map that or tie it to these aesthetic mappings. So a car with a really big engine maybe has a really big point or it's really far away from 
the intersection of these positional axes, or it's darker in color or something. So that's the basic intuition behind this. And again, this is something that I think we all sort of understand on some deep intuitive level, but to actually talk about it and you know formalize this, I think is really powerful. And another thing that I don't have a lot of time to talk about today, but I really recommend you read about if you're interested, is the idea that there have been a bunch of perceptual studies that have found that some of these aesthetic mappings or visual qualities are sort of more intuitive to human eyes and minds than others. So we're really good at looking at like position and size, but something like angle is actually really hard for humans to, so if I show you two angles that are like barely different, you're not gonna know which is which, but if I show you like, um, you know, something that is a little bit thicker than the other one, you're gonna have a better time doing that. Um, and that probably just goes back to how we evolved and uh, things like that. Um, so, so, so if you wanna be careful about that, you probably wanna stay away from certain things like angles and volume that are harder and stick with some of these more basic ones. Um, although for certain purposes, you can, you can also try different stuff. But the basic idea is that, you know, we're taking our data and then we're turning it into some sort of visual representation. And now the last thing that we need to kind of complete that is we need scales. And so we need to say that, okay, we have, let's say the displacement, the size of the engine, and we want to represent that using a positional axis, like the X axis. But we need to then define how big is that scale? Does it, what does it range from? So here maybe it goes from like one to seven, um, you know, and, and they're equally spaced. Uh, but you can imagine different scales. Uh, for instance, you might not use a positional axis, but you might use, you know, color, and you can have discrete colors uh, like this. So you have either four cylinders or six or eight, but you don't have like five and a half cylinders unless your car is in like really rough shape or something. Um, and then you might have a different uh, variable that's not actually uh, discrete, uh, but is continuous. And then you could still use color for that, um, but it would be a different type of color scale that ranges from you know, a specific type of quality to another one, like hue or saturation or something like that. Um, you can also use other things too, like you can have a scale of different shapes. Shapes tend to work well with discrete variables. Um, and then something like size would work well for like a continuous variable, but you gotta be a little careful with size. But the idea is that the scales are going to basically take that aesthetic mapping that you defined and it's gonna like formalize it and say not just that, you know, position is represented, or is representing engine size, but that specifically this level of um, position is representing this amount of engine size difference, okay? It also will create you know, axes and legends, things like this when you create the scales. And then finally, we wanna then have actual things that we create on the plot. So this is you know, kind of a basic uh, like first layer of a plot, but we wanna then plot the stuff in there so we can actually use these scales. And so those things are called geoms or geometric objects, okay? And basically that would be things like a scatter plot like this. You know? So each of these dots represents one observation from our data set. And its position in this space is defined by the size of that car's engine and the highway fuel efficiency in this case. Okay. You could also think about how you have this here, but you could go a little wild, like we showed earlier, and not just have a single geome, but you could stack multiple geomes on top of each other. So you could put these uh, dots down, then you can also then put on top of it colors, you can put on top of that uh, another layer of you know these regression lines and another layer of these standard error bands, add a scale when you add the color, all this kind of stuff. You're basically building this layer by layer. That's why it's called the layered grammar of graphics. So that's, those are the basic elements, the data, the aesthetic mappings, the scales, and then the geoms. So with just this, you can probably create probably every graph that you would mostly need for the rest of your career. I could see somebody going the rest of their life without ever learning the advanced elements. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the advanced elements, but um, I wanna see, are there any questions about the basic elements before we go on? Okay. So the advanced elements, I'm gonna just talk about these on a very high level, um, are statistical transformations or stats, coordinate systems, faceting specifications, and themes. So, uh, I would say that like the geomes and the stats are the kind of the two really important elements of uh, the layered grammar of graphics. And if you master those two, you're gonna be able to go really far. 
Um, basically, what statistical transformations do is they allow you to take your data, so let's say those 230 cars, and then we can transform or summarize that data in some way. So let's say that we want to not plot every single car from the data set, have like 300 dots or bars or whatever, but instead we want to plot some sort of a summary of that. So let's, in this case, break up every single uh, or all of those cars into the classes. So we have pickup trucks, SUVs, minivans, two-seaters, midsize, subcompacts, and compacts. And then instead of plotting all of those points, let's plot some sort of a summary of them. Like in this case, the mean and a confidence interval. And so what the stat is gonna allow you to do is instead of having to separately calculate what the mean is and separately calculate what the confidence interval bounds are, save those as new variables and then plot those, you can just give it the raw data and then you can ask it to transform the data to give you a summary in the form of mean and confidence intervals and, and other things like that. And then you could make it rainbow colored and uh, make it very pretty. So that's the basic idea behind stats, uh, but you can go much further than this. Uh, again, we're just scratching the surface. I think this is kind of the mean and compositable stuff is probably what you're most likely to use, but you can do all sorts of transformations. You can make your data like log scale, you can make it um, standardized. There's all sorts of things that you might wanna do, and this allows you to do that very easily and quickly. Um, but like I said, uh, you know, different graphs are going to need different choices. So here, maybe it makes a lot of sense to group these and to plot them as summaries, but maybe you do want to see all of the data plotted separately. So we can do that. So this would be an example of all of that data plotted, where now, instead of mapping the, uh, the class on the x-axis, we've added a new x-axis, which is like the city miles per gallon, and then we've turned class into a color scale, okay? And what I want to talk about next is coordinate systems. So coordinate system basically controls where your scales and your geomes are positioned. And so this is like the default. This is called the Cartesian coordinate system, where you have things like, you know, we're going from like zero to 50-ish, and then zero to 50-ish. And it's just basically expanding this to fit the space that's available. And since a lot of the right side of this graphic is taken up by the legend, it kind of crams it, squishes it uh, more to the left and makes it kind of tall. Um, and, and in some cases, that's fine. But in other cases, like this one, these are actually the same unit, miles per gallon on both. So it's kind of misleading to have this 40 be, I don't know what this is, you know, like six inches, and then this to be something like 12 inches. So that could be kind of misleading. So you might want to constrain that so that, you know, 10 miles per gallon is the same on the X and Y axis. And all you have to do to achieve that is change the coordinate system. So you can go from the Cartesian coordinate system to something called like the fixed coordinate system. And then it scrunches it back down, it makes it perfectly square. Um, and that was just with like a single line of code, really easy to do. Uh, another thing that you might do would be, again, if, instead of plotting these as like the raw values, you might wanna plot them on like logarithmic scale. So you can do that too. And now you see, you know, the distance between, you know, zero and 10 is much greater than the distance between like 30 and 40. In this data set, that's not super useful, but there's some types of variables where that's really useful because like the unit itself is meaningful, but the range is so vast that to look at it on a linear scale would be um, problematic. So something like GDP, uh, some countries are super rich, but a lot of them are more on the lower end. And so using a log scale for that is helpful. Um, so anyway, and then you might have other types of things too, if you have special data, like if you have geographic data, you need a new coordinate system for longitude and latitude. Uh, I work a lot with like circular data, and so we had to create a whole new coordinate system for circular data. Um, and one of the cool things about ggplot2 is that you can create all of this stuff yourself. So if you want a new geome, you can make it. If you want a new stat, you can make it. If you want a new coordinate system like I did for circular data, you can just make it and then put it online, share it with people. So it's pretty cool. Um, next, I want to talk about faceting. So faceting is really cool. It was like blew me away when I first saw it. Um, so let's say that we want to look at uh, all of, we want to look at the relationship of our data, but we want to break it apart by different class of cars. So one way to do that would be, as we showed before, you can use like color or something, but you might want to actually look at them on like almost separate subgraphs. And so that's what faceting allows you to do. So now we have one graphic, but it's broken into these sub facets where each of those is plotting only the subset of data that corresponds to like that class, for instance. Uh, so you can do this for any type of, uh, discrete variable. 
Um, and that can be really helpful. So like in psychology, for instance, I do this a lot with, if I collect a lot of data from a bunch of participants, I might have one graphic that shows like summaries of that overall, but then I might have another graphic that then shows each individual's data faceted by that person. So then you can see, oh, for a lot of people, there's this like, positive relationship, and then for a few, there's actually a negative or a null relationship, and it gives you a better sense of that kind of distribution of like random effects, I guess, if you're familiar with multi-level modeling. Um, so anyway, that's quite powerful. Um, and then finally, we can do something uh, with theme where maybe we like the way that the data is laid out and the geomes and all this stuff, but we want it to look a little different. Like for instance, I've always been using this kind of theme where we have this gray background with white grid lines. And I think that's nice when you're presenting on like a white background like this and you're on a screen, but for printing, it's kind of wasteful of ink. So maybe we would really prefer it to be white background with like gray grid lines. Um, so all you have to do is use a new theme and then it does that. It keeps all the data the same, just changes what it looks like. You can even go wild. Uh, maybe you're going to like some sort of a gothic convention. You can turn it dark. Um, so there's all sorts of options. There's even ones for like, if you're familiar with a web comic, like XKCD, there's like a theme that makes your graphs look like their graphs. So you can have a lot of fun with it. Um, and some of the themes will control everything. Uh, but you can also go in and use the themes to tweak certain elements of your graphic. So if you're like, I love this, but I really want this here, this displacement label, to be in Comic Sans. Mm, that'll look good. <laughs> you can go in and do exactly that. Um, so there's a lot of power with the theming. All right, so that's those are the advanced elements. Any questions about those? All right, so now I want to go into the practice part, and then we'll end with a little bit more principle. Uh, but the practice part is that we're going to go through some of the R code. And I, I can't, unfortunately, teach you R or ggplot2 in an hour. Um, but I'm hoping to, again, give you this intuition where you understand kind of how these principles I've been talking about get implemented within there. Uh, and then you'll, you'll be able to download my slides and the syntax and all that. And you'll be able to understand that, how to recreate that if you want to. Um, but even if you never use R, you never use ggplot2, I'm hoping you'll get some value out of this to again, just see how you could take these principles and implement them in practice. So the first thing I wanna talk about is that if you wanna get, uh, if you wanna use R but you've never done that before, I just wanna give you a real quick one slide crash course. Um, you can download R for free from uh, uh, cloud.r-project.org. You can download R Studio. So R, when you open it, if you just install that, it's just like a white window. That's gonna give you like a panic attack probably. So what's nice is you can download R Studio, which is kind of like an environment for it. And then you still have that white console window here, but it gives you extra stuff too, like your files are here, your variables are here, all your graphics are gonna be nicely displayed here as well. Um, so I think that's really nice. Like sometimes I think about this as like, R is the engine and then R Studio is sort of like the chassis that you ride in. And then together they're a sweet car. Uh, but <laughs> individually they kind of suck. Like who wants just a chassis or just an engine? Um, all right, so <laughs> once, you, uh, once you download and install both of those, uh, you'll then open up our Studio Desktop, and then only once, the first time you do this, you need to download and install the ggplot2 package. You can do that with this uh, command. And then every time you wanna use it, you need to tell it, I wanna use ggplot2 this time in R uh, with this command. So the reason it doesn't load it automatically is like, like me, if you have like hundreds of packages, if it loaded all of them every time I started R, I'd be like always waiting a couple of minutes, which would suck. So, but this allows you to kind of control it. Like, okay, this time I'm gonna use these four packages. Um, and then next time I might use a different set. Um, and this is kind of what our studio looks like. So let's dive into some visualization. Some of those graphs that I showed you earlier are what we're gonna recreate here. And what I want you to really think about is again, those principles, those elements of the grammar of graphics and how they get implemented. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a new variable called layer zero. Uh, and this is something you probably in practice would never do, but I think it's, it's helpful educationally. And you then create a new graphic object with the ggplot function, and you give it the first basic element it needs, which is the data. So you say, okay, the data is in the variable cars, uh, and then it'll spit out an object that's just empty. So the data's back there somewhere, um, but we haven't told it to like how to represent those numbers and letters as visualizations, so it's just a empty gray box. Now, we can need the second element. So who remembers what is what comes after data? Aesthetic, Aesthetic mappings, perfect. 
So to add that, all we have to do is we add this here. Mapping equals AES, her aesthetic, and then we tell it what uh, visual qualities we want to tie to each variable. So okay, we want dispool, which is the displacement, the engine size, to be on the x-axis. We want highway fuel efficiency to be on the y. And then maybe we want to get fancy and put the number of cylinders as color. Then it's going to create this, where now it looks at the data and it makes its best guess at what the ranges should be. So it's like, all right, highway fuel efficiency tends to be between like 10 and 40. So we'll put that as a default. Uh, displacement tends to be between two and eight liters. We'll put that as a default. And then cylinders seems to be four, six, or eight. So we'll put that as a default. But the next thing is scale. So we can actually override this and configure it. And so now we can go in and say, all right, we want to take that object we created here, uh, layer one, and then we're just literally going to add to it with like the plus sign. We're going to add to it extra stuff. <coughs> so we're going to add to it a continuous X scale and say, you know, it already assumed it was, but let's confirm this is supposed to be a continuous X scale. And then we can do stuff like we can tell it its name, we give it a fancy label, uh, we can tell it what the limit should be. So maybe instead of it being one to seven, we want it to be zero to eight. So then you can override it and make it zero to eight. You can do the same thing for the Y axis. Um, and then you can do the same thing with the, the color scale. But here, instead of it being continuous, we're explicitly saying this is a discrete scale. So don't give me, you know, like a, a gradient going from four to eight cylinders, but give me separate discrete colors for four, six, and eight cylinders. All right. The next thing we want to do is we want to add some geoms. Yeah. Sorry. So here, how does it? Is this based on what you did in layer one? That like the first one is going to be mapping on. So it remembers what the mapping is because we saved that in the object. But I'm just saying, like the order that you're using, just based on the order, or was there some place where you said, like, for the x variable, here's what I want the scale to be in this layer two? Um, so like so I say that I want x to be displacement, mm -hmm. and then here I say I want it to have a label displacement. Oh, it's, it's scale x continuous. Okay. Scale x continuous, exactly. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Sorry if that's hard to see, um, but you you specifically say that this is the one. And if you had a, a size scale or a shape scale, it would just be scale, shape, or scale, size. Do you want MT colors, or do you just have cars? I have a subset of the MPG data set. Okay. So if you go to the website, but yeah, you can just use MPG, and this, this will work. Oh, okay. Yep. It comes with ggplot, too. But yeah, I made a subset just to make it a little bit easier for people. <laughs> Um, yeah. Do you have to do this in two steps also? Or no. Like, okay, so you can make the whole Almost order. always you're going to do this in one. Okay. It's just hard to fit that in PowerPoint. No, that's okay. Okay, super helpful. Yeah, and also I think it helps like educationally to understand that you're literally building this layer yeah. by layer. No, I just didn't know mm -hmm. like when you go to make these things, like, well, I, I it's, have it's to always one giant okay. command, yeah, with just a bunch of pluses stringed together. Okay. Yep. And so now here you don't use ggplot at all. Is that because layer two or layer one had been created? Layer one ggplot? is already a ggplot object. Yep. Okay. But if I were to combine these, then yeah, I would start with this, and then instead of saving it to layer one, I could save it as layer two, and then just keep adding pluses, yeah. Yeah. and then do this as well. Yeah. Okay. But you can pull it out in intermediate steps uh, as well if you want to. Uh, and again, I think that helps visualize it. Uh, so the last thing we want to do is now we want to actually plot the data. So it knows where it should be, but we haven't told it how to plot it, right? It could plot it as bars, or as points, or as um, circles, or as triangles, whatever. Um, as box plots maybe. So now we need to tell it what type of geometric object or geom we want it to have. And we do that with very simply geom, they all start with this, underscore, and then the type of graph. So a scatter plot type of graph is called geom point. Uh, you're gonna have to unfortunately memorize some of these things, uh, but there's a cheat sheet I'll uh, show you at the end that's really helpful. Um, and then you can configure it. So we can say, well, the shape of the points should be circles, and the size should be like two millimeters. Uh, and then it'll plot this out, and now it takes all of those original data points and it puts them in here like that. Okay, does that, that make sense? It also remembers, again, that we already have these three scales and it plots it accordingly. The last thing we can do um, to make this a little bit fancier is we can now layer on just another geom on top of it. So now if we wanna put in those smoothers, you know, or that, that linear regression line, it's just another geom that we add on top. The order that you call them determines which one overlaps which. So it's literally in like chronological order. So we did the points because we want those in back, 
then we do this layer, we put those on top, could have done it the other way. Uh, and then there's some extra options, like maybe we want to use LM for the method, which is like a linear model, just a linear regression, but you can do low S, or you can do all sorts of different types. Um, and then if you want, you can turn on these standard error bars to give a sense of like the variability in what that slope should be um, and what the intercept should be. So uh, I, I like that. So I turn that on with SE equals true. You could turn it off with SE equals false. Okay. The last thing that I would want to do, like let's say, like if I just want to look at this and that was my purpose, I'd probably be happy with this. I'd be done. But if I want to publish this with a set of paper, I might want to go a little bit further. Maybe I'll apply a theme. Again, I don't want to print all this gray, so let's change the theme. And then maybe I think like it's a little cramped. And I think if this was a, if the legend for cylinders was on top, maybe that would be a little better. So I'll show you how to do that. So now all you do is you take that layer, layer four, and then you add it a theme. So the omnibus, like big overarching changes. Um, this is the BW theme or black and white theme that looks like this. So I say theme underscore BW, then applies all of that. Um, I think that looks quite nice. And then if I wanna change a specific element, then I just use the theme command, and then I tell it what I wanna change and what I wanna change it to. So I want the legend dot position to be top. And then it moves it up there. And uh, you know, I think that this is, you know, it's a basic graph, but I think it looks pretty good. And we did that with, yeah, just kind of by building up five different layers. Uh, the last thing that we would wanna do, again, we now have this nice graphic that we're happy with in R, but we can't then just sort of like give our laptop to the publisher and be like, figure it out. So we need to somehow export this into like a file of some sort. So I wanna talk about this real briefly, uh, that basically there's two primary types of graphic files. Um, one is called vector, and that is basically you represent all of your shapes as mathematical equations. And what's nice about these is they're really smooth and you can scale them all the way down to be like engraved on a keychain, or you can take that same file and scale it up and like blow it on the side of a building and it'll have no quality loss. Whereas something like a roster, like an image you take from a camera, um, despite what Law & Order SVU or you know what these like enhance uh, uh, TV shows will tell you, you can't just blow these up and they'll look good, right? Uh, I work in a computer vision department and that's not possible. Um, it's gonna look like this, all pixelated. So unfortunately, you don't typically want to use this for things like uh, diagrams. If you have an image, like a photorealistic image, that actually works well if you have a ton of pixels. Um, but for something like this, you don't want that. So usually you're going to want to save it as you know, something like, uh, like a PDF or an EPS or an SVG. These are all vector formats. And then you can give that to the publisher. Um, or if for like for my presentation here, PowerPoint freaks out if you give it a vector file, unfortunately. So you still sometimes do have to use rosters, but you can use R to conform uh, or to control exactly how big it should be so that it looks good at that size. And so for instance, I use this command to make all of the figures in this presentation, where I say GG save, I give it the layer five, let's say, is the object I want to save. I give it a file name, and then I tell it what height and width and units and uh, resolution I want it to be in. And so for this, I had looked in here and I made like a square on here and I looked at the size in PowerPoint. It was like six by five inches. I thought that looked nice. So then I exported all of my images as six by five. Um, you might, if you make it bigger or small, you might need to change the font size, but otherwise it's gonna work really well. Um, so that, that's really powerful and actually is one of the things that I like about ggplot2 over other more advanced things. Um, that, you know, if you're interested, I can talk about that more, but um, I will uh, continue on for now. So any- Quick question. Yeah. Does it automatically know what type of file you want to save it as? Uh, so if you give it an extension, it'll it, it will, it. yeah, it'll match it. Okay. You also, there's another argument where if you just gave it fig one with no extension, then it would ask for a device, and then you could say device equals PNG or device equals PDF or whatever. Uh, any questions about the more practical side? So again, I recognize that you're not now suddenly experts in our ggplot, but I'm hoping that you got kind of an intuition of how this was implemented. Yeah. It's a little bit of a minor question, but yeah. does it save the background as um, uh, transparent. transparent? Yeah. Uh, depending on the file type, yes. Okay. So but if you PNG supports transparency. PNG supports transparency. Like GIF does as well. Okay. Uh, the vectors all do. But yeah, if you save it as a bitmap or a JPEG, okay. it won't. Right. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, yep. Yeah. So just very quickly, I recommend ping. I think is really nice if you want something that retains high quality, but if file size is really important, JPEG is nice. Uh, that's why most cameras take JPEG images. 
Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is what I think about is like the visualization workflow. So these are more of like the practical principles. So instead of the more theoretical principles of like, what is a graphic? This is more of like, how do I actually do this in practice? Like, and I, I kind of like to think of myself as, yeah, I'm a scientist primarily, but you know, I kind of think of myself as like an amateur graphic designer. And um, you know, so I, I think the more effort and uh, thought you put into this stuff, I think the better your uh, products are gonna be. So I think what's really important is instead of just, you know, going into SPSS and doing a regression and then asking for a graph, taking whatever that spits out and putting it in your figure, I think taking some time to really think about it is going to help a lot. So the first thing I think you should do before you even open R is you should define what your goals are, uh, what your purpose is, your audience, your data, your message, your values. And then once you have a good definition of what you're trying to do, then go through the design process. So let's go through each of these quickly. Uh, why do you think that defining your purpose in making a visualization is important? Because you need to know what you're trying to communicate to your audience. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you trying to tell them? Because otherwise, it, it won't, there won't be any parameters set, right? Yeah. Like you can just throw anything up there. So what are some questions that you might ask yourself to figure out what your purpose is for a given image you're creating or graphic? Yep. Yeah, I was gonna say sort of like, what's your main take-home message? I mm -hmm. have all these details. If I want them to leave with like one, yeah, one idea, what my one idea? Exactly. So a lot of those are kind of different bullet points, but for purpose, uh, I came up with some questions. You can have other ones too. But things like, why am I creating this graphic? What are my goals for it? What level of polish is needed? This ends up being a really important question. Like, is this something that I'm just going to give to my advisor for exploration? Or is this something that I'm going to try to send to, you know, my new PNAS paper or something, my new science paper? Um, so, you know, that's going to have a very different thing. You know, am I sending this to the New Yorker with an op-ed? Um, there, it's going to have very different kind of constraints and parameters on that. I think also if you're thinking about this being for a poster versus a presentation versus a website, these are all going to have implications for what, how you design things, how much detail you put in, how much polish you put on, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then sometimes there's constraints too, like maybe this publisher wants to charge you $600 for a single color figure, right? So then maybe you need to figure out how to design this in black and white. Um, so anyway, think about this stuff and I think it's going to help you kind of take that infinite possibility space and start narrowing it down to something more manageable. The next question is um, defining your audience. So why might this be important? So your uh, your audience might have different desires. Well, like some people are used to seeing data presented in a certain way. Uh -huh. um, so they yeah. So they might have different expectations. And yeah. So they might have different expectations and experiences in the past. Yeah. Might be presenting to a layperson versus somebody familiar with what they're doing and might change yeah. what detail I show. Absolutely. So yeah, they have different levels of knowledge, both in sort of a specific domain sense, but maybe even in a general like science sense. Uh, absolutely. Anyone else? Okay. So again, I've got a couple ones. Things like, um, what do they already know? So maybe don't put a ton of effort into showing them things they already know. What do they need to know? That kind of gets to the message we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and then also to uh, Katie's point, you know, kind of what will they understand and what will they expect? So, you know, there might be certain things where I personally, having read all these books about data viz, maybe I think this is the best way to present the data. But if everyone who looks at that other than me has no idea of what it's communicating, then that is a failure, I think, as, as a graphic. Um, so you really need to think about kind of what they're expecting and what they're going to be able to understand. Uh, defining your data. How about this? What kinds of questions might you need to ask for defining your data? data actually serves to actually serves your purpose versus what's irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah, so there might be uh, certain observations, certain variables. If you try to put all of your data and all of your variables on one graphic, it might be overwhelming. Um, so you might want to try to limit that down in some way. What else? Yeah, yeah so what what is sort of the form of that data? Yeah. And that would inform things like what scales you pick, 
um, what types of aesthetic mappings you choose, things like that. Um, so yeah, so things like what observations, what variables, are you gonna group things? Like maybe you want there to be one graph with everybody, or maybe you want one graph for men, one for women, or maybe a single graph that's faceted or colored or shaped by the gender variable. So you have so many options, and this is kind of, I think, where it becomes more of an art than a science. Um, there's certainly science elements. Like I said, there's these studies on human perception, and um, I think we want to learn about that as much as we can. But there's also you know, a sense of, of design, and I think there's also a chance to kind of put your stamp on it. Um, so I think that's actually one of the, the benefits here. You might also want to think about, am I going to use the raw data or some sort of summary? And when we talk about values in a moment, we'll see sometimes there's a real conflict. Maybe you, for some reasons, for some values, you want to show the raw data, but then for other things, you, you want to show summaries. Uh, this is, I think, one of the biggest ones that people don't think about enough. Um, and this kind of gets to what Christy, I think, was saying, is define your message. So what, what might that mean? And how can you figure out what your message is? Yep. Okay. Exactly. Did you have something similar? Yeah, mine was similar. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is that's the basic intuition here. Um, so what should they conclude? What's their takeaway? I think another thing people don't really think about enough, especially in you know this new reproducibility crisis or uh, what is it now, the credibility revolution. Um, how confident should they be in walking away from these results? Do you want them to look at this graph and be like, there is absolutely an association between these variables or a difference between these groups? Or do you want them to walk away and think, there might be, but it's it's kind of up in the air still. And again, I think the different design choices you make in visualizing that data, whether you put error bars or confidence intervals, or whether you present summary statistics versus raw data, could really inform their confidence. Um, also, the annotations you put on, like captions, things like that, could inform that. Another thing that I think people don't think about enough is like emotion. So do you want them to walk away like surprised? Um, or do you want them to walk away kind of confident and like smugly like, oh, I knew that already? Um, or sometimes, and I think about Aiden has a good example of this, where maybe the point you're trying to make with your graph is to actually make somebody feel overwhelmed. So even though most design principle um, would kind of be like, you always want them to be clear and, and obvious and comfortable, sometimes you actually want people to walk away like, oh my god, this is a shit show. And that's sort of the whole point. And so you can actually design your graph in a way that makes you feel that way. Um, and, and again, Aiden has a really good example of something like that. I hope that was your message. Because uh, <laughs> if not, then that was an insult, and I apologize. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and then finally, and this is, I think, a part of just broader design, like making presentations in particular, is what questions should they be left with? So one of the things that I like to do most, and I don't know about how successful I was in this presentation, but for like, my job talk, I put a lot of time into, if somebody at the end of my slide, or after looking at this graph, what do people want to know next? And then if your next slide answers that, oh, that feels so good to the audience. And it feels like this is a cohesive, well-designed, um, you know, kind of presentation that, um, you know, they're really engaged with. I think that's how you hold people's engagement. So really, really think about that. And if you're gonna have, you know, again, a presentation with multiple figures or um, a poster that has figures that flow, consider this. Where does each one leave off? Where does each one pick up? Um, all right, and then finally, uh, the values, I think, are super important. And I'm just gonna jump into this because we're running out of time a little bit, but this is the last slide. Um, so I think that each of us is going to have our own values for the data visualizations we create. And then I think each product is gonna have some demands on that as well. Um, and I think we need to really think about that carefully and then also think about, like, choose our techniques, like what geomes and stats and scales that we use to facilitate uh, and empower those values. So for instance, you know, I couldn't find a list of values online, so I just made one. Um, you could have different ones, but I think of these five as being pretty core values of data viz. So things like honesty or accuracy, you know, am I showing the raw data? Can you really understand kind of what this relationship is, or am I misleading things in some way? There's like a really famous example of like a Fox News plot where it looks like these three bars are super different, but then when you look at the scales, they've cut it so that it doesn't go from zero to 10, it goes from like nine to 10. And so then this giant difference, if you actually looked at it uh, in the right context, would look really small. So that, that, that's an example of honesty, I think. 
Um, accessibility is another really important value. Um, so things like if somebody doesn't have the same education or background that I have, will they still be able to access that information? If somebody's colorblind, will they be able to access that information? If they can't read English, will they be able to access that information? Um, I don't think we think about that kind of stuff enough. In fact, I have a lot of red in here, which would not be good for colorblind individuals. Um, clarity, I think clarity is often at odds with honesty, where often in order to achieve clarity, we sort of oversimplify the truth. And so I'm not gonna say that, oh, we have to be honest all the time and screw clarity. I think that this is a continuum. And all I think we need to do is just be very mindful about where we place it. And if you're presenting to a lay audience versus a scientific audience, you may be able to choose different uh, points. Beauty is another thing, again, if you're going to the New Yorker versus, um, I don't know, some really esoteric journal in your field, um, you know, beauty might have some different um, weightings. Um, and then flexibility is important too. So maybe you want low flexibility, like you want one graph where every single person who looks at this walks away with the same message and the same takeaway. Um, or maybe you want to create maybe a little more challenging, maybe a little less accessible graph that's more flexible. So you look at it this way and you get one takeaway. Then you look at it again from a different angle, you get a different takeaway. So that might be your goal. And that's also, I think, a really valid value. Uh, and this is, I think, another example where we're moving beyond just static images to things like websites and interactive visualizations where you can actually go in and say, show me just the men, show me just the houses over this size or whatever. And then you can actually let the user control this a little bit more and get what they want out of it. And I think that is really prioritizing flexibility, perhaps at some expense of clarity and accessibility. Um, so really think about what, what your purpose is or your audience is, that kind of thing. And then finally, oh, I forgot about this. So then I, I don't have one for each of these, I promise. Um, but basically, I think you want to always consider the grammar when you're actually designing. So think about what geomes um, and uh, mappings make sense. Um, solicit feedback from people. Uh, and then basically iterate this process. Don't just make one and then send it off. I think try a bunch of different things. And yeah, that takes a while and maybe it's a pain, but I don't know. If you are a, a geek like me, I guess, um, you, know, you might actually enjoy doing this and, and tweaking these things and, and seeing how successful they are. And one thing that I really like doing actually is when I have a graph that I'm happy with or I want to test, I will write down on a piece of paper what I think the takeaway message is and then I fold it up and then I give the graphic but not that paper to somebody else and ask them to write down what they think the takeaway message is. And if they're different, like substantially different, then either I've successfully been flexible or I failed at, at clarity, right? Um, so I think that's a really useful um, you know, kind of exercise to do. And then finally, really think about where are the eyes being drawn? So use things like contrast and color to be like, when I look at this graphic, I'm looking here and that's where the takeaway message is. So you can really guide people's eyes in that way. So if you wanna learn more about this stuff, uh, these are some books that I've read in recent years that I really liked. So if you wanna learn more about R in general, including some stuff about ggplot, R for data science is awesome. If you wanna learn more about ggplot in particular, there's a book on that and then just graphic design in general and data visualization in general. Uh, the Truthful Art is a recent book that I like a lot. And then kind of the Bible, the classic, is Visual Display of Quantitative Information um, from Edward Tufte. Uh, there's some good websites you can check out, including the, a cheat sheet on ggplot2. If you can't remember what that geom's called or you know how to change the legend position, it's all gonna be on there. Um, and yeah, you also can, there's other alternatives. So, like if you're really hardcore, then maybe you'll use like D3, which is like a JavaScript library. Um, or if you wanna, you can get some paid software like Tableau. I make all of my uh, posters in Adobe Illustrator. Um, and you can go from R to Adobe Illustrator and kind of get the best, both, the best of both worlds. Uh, so there's lots of options. Um, so that's all I've got. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you have any questions now, I'm happy to take them and also feel free to email me. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you have kind of like basic plots that you tend to look at data in? Like mm -hmm. some basic structure? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I think it depends on what type of data you tend to work with, but I mean, I think scatter plots are hard to beat. Scatter plots are awesome. I, I also am a big fan of box plots. Um, also, the just like density plots, so like the cumulative density function or uh, the empirical density function, I think those are super helpful. Um, but yeah, it kind of depends a bit on your data. But, but yeah, before you ever, I think, open up um, 
the statistical analysis. I think you should really explore the data a little bit visually. So in terms of um, like how you Yeah, so uh, there's something called uh, like R notebooks where you can actually input syntax to do things in R and then right after it, it then has the output too. So it saves in one big file, like an HTML file, it saves both the input and its output, which is super helpful. So I, with every project I make an R notebook and then I'll, yeah, I'll do things like, first I usually like tidy up the data, like I'll import it, I'll clean it up. Then I do some explore and some exploratory analysis. Some of that's visualization. Some of that is just looking at like statistical computations, like what is the are the min and max what I expect, and you know that kind of thing. Uh, but then yeah, going forward into that, and then finally I do the data analysis last. Okay, and, that all and that's all in you know one file, uh, and then I can send that to my uh, collaborators. And uh, usually they, I think they like that. I don't know, Jaden, do you like that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Well, if there's no other questions, again, thanks a lot, and uh, I, I hope you'll give R and uh, GGplot2 a shot.